Good afternoon and welcome to the Livewire, UNC Charlotte's forum for conversations with newsmakers from here on campus and beyond. I'm Will City. Few would question the importance of a robust public education system to the health of American society. Yet a glance at the issues facing schools across the country makes one thing clear. Philosophical agreement that education matters doesn't make coming up with practical solutions any easier. Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools is no exception. As the new school year is set to begin, CMS faces teacher shortages, financial question marks, and a looming review of its student assignment plan. On today's Livewire, we'll take a look at these challenges and how CMS and its partners plan to address them. Joining me in studio is Eric Davis, who serves on the Charlotte Mecklenburg County and North Carolina State Board of Education. Also with us is Bill Anderson, who heads up community relations at the UNC Charlotte College of Education. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. I want to start off by uh, just sharing your background a little bit uh, and telling me how you've been involved with education here in the community. Let's start with you, Eric. Well, my involvement started in 1969 as a CMS student, and uh, today I'm glad to be a CMS parent and a member of the local and state board of education. Uh, as you can tell, I'm a little older than Eric. I began my career as a teacher in Charlotte Mecklenburg in 1976. I was a teacher for 11 years. I was an assistant principal for four years. I was a principal for 13 years. And then I served as an assistant superintendent for one year before retiring and going into other education-related businesses. Well, let's jump right into the budget, shall we? Uh, the General Assembly is still working on a state budget at this point and are running up on the deadline on the continuing resolution that they passed to the original July 1st deadline. Uh, Eric, as you await their decisions at the state level, what are the priorities fiscally uh, at CMS? Well, we made our priorities real clear when we made our state mandated request of the county back in May, and it's in line with the guiding principles and philosophy that the system has been operating under for years. That's to further our students' academic achievement. This year we asked for really four things for the county to partner with us on. One was to be prepared to receive 2,400 more students this year. Second was to be able to abide by the state mandated pass-through payment to charter schools, which would be about $8 million. Uh, third was to partner with us on increasing the literacy of our students because we all know the critical role that that plays and our superintendent has clearly pointed that literacy out as our North Star. And then last was we asked for support for uh, incredibly modest but well-deserved 2% pay increase. And all that totaled just shy of $40 million in terms of a county request. We received just over a third of that request. So we're not going to be able to provide our staff that pay increase. We won't be able to fund the literacy program because we have to be prepared for the growth in students. And we have to make the payment to the charter schools. So the effect of the um, county's response was at best a $4 million cut to us uh, based on the requirement to make the payment to charter schools. Um, and as far as the state budget, um, what we're faced with is trying to balance getting the year off to a good start with positive optimism and excitement for our students with a looming threat of a reduction in force um, over our teacher assistants, 539 of those, as well as the inability to hire any uh, you know, additional teachers in an effective way because most of those teacher candidates are gone. They were hired in April. Now, this, this delay is not particularly abnormal. If you look at past years, uh, passing the deadline is, is something that happens quite often in the General Assembly. But what kind of challenges is the district facing when it's dealing with that uncertainty of a budget uh, not being agreed upon yet? Well, unfortunately, you're right. It's not unusual, but that's sort of like saying, um, you know, I've got a rock in my shoe and I've gotten used to it because my foot is calloused and numb. Uh, the damage continues and the cumulative effect of year over year making long strides like CMS has just furthers the impact of this type of um, irresponsibility at the state level. Um, moreover, the deep years of un underfunded budgets locally have reduced CMS's flexibility to deal with the uncertainty. 
in the past we were able to manage through a crisis like this and um, start the year in better shape. Th this year we have no flexibility. We have, we're so stressed to begin with that now this uncertainty, we used to be able to cover it up and we can't anymore. So unfortunately our students will feel it, our parents will see it, our teachers are definitely living with it. And um, so what we really have is a systemic problem. Um, the, the best teacher candidates, as I mentioned, are available in April. Successful businesses have their budget far in advance of the beginning of the year and are able to plan and motivate their staff to get excited about the coming year. Um, the fact that we would have a budget at earliest in July is difficult at best. The fact that school starts week after next and we're still wrestling with these issues is a catastrophe. Now, Bill, I want to ask you, once the budget is finalized, what's the role of the College of Education and other outside groups in, in filling the needs of CMS? Well, I, I think that uh, paying attention to, first of all, UNC Charlotte is a regional university. And so while CMS is a very big partner in the very large district, we have a number of other districts that are close by that we also have very strong relationships with. So I think it's important for the university and the College of Education to listen to our partners, to hear what the needs are in Cleveland County and Rowan County and Cabarrus County, as well as CMS. But when I think about needs in CMS and I think about what is the College of Education doing now, I immediately think about two things. Uh, one is the early college program that's on our campus, which is this, the STEM school where we have young students age uh, 14 to 18 that are basically getting their high school education on our campus. It's been wildly successful. The wait list is in the hundreds. Uh, I think about another initiative that Eric spoke about just briefly, and that is the literacy initiative. And while it's unfortunate that that was not funded with county dollars, the superintendent has begun something called her North Star Literacy Project, and she is asking different organizations throughout the community to support a specific school. The superintendent's going to be meeting with the entire faculty of the College of Education and challenging us to become engaged with one high school, excuse me, one elementary school. So we're really looking forward to that as well. Now, we've heard articulated from leadership at a number of levels that that CMS is positioned and the Charlotte area is positioned to be the best school district in the country. Is that an overly ambitious goal or is, is that something that's possible? Um, I don't think it's overly ambitious at all. Um, I tell you, I, I, I'm a native North Carolinian. My family and I have benefited from the visionary leadership of folks like Jim Martin and Jim Hunt and Bill Friday and they didn't back off of raising North Carolina to be a leader in public education in the nation. Um, as a child, I remember watching the Apollo moonshots, and we were led from being behind the pack as a nation in the space race to being the leader by a young, ambitious president who challenged us, who put his own personal reputation and our nations at risk and said, we can do better, and we will do better if we work together. Um, what's missing today is that type of visionary, positive, optimistic, can-do North Carolina leadership. And we need that statewide. Uh, we're um, working hard as nine members of the Board of Education and along with our superintendent, uh, Ms. Clark, to provide that same optimistic leadership here in CMS. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be second to anybody. And my child and your child don't deserve to be second. I want to be the best. Let's get on with it. What are your thoughts on that question? Uh, I, I would agree with Eric, and I, I think Eric's point about leadership is incredibly important. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have today is that North Carolina, for many years, was perceived as a leader in the Southeast in vision and education, and we'd like to get back to where we were at one time. I think we've, uh, you know, that, that's been a challenge for us lately. Let's shift topics now and let's talk about these teacher shortages that the district is dealing with. What's the outlook right now as the school year is quickly approaching, Eric? Well, I think first we ought to keep it in perspective. 
Uh, as of today, we have 347 vacancies. All but 147 have recommendations. Um, and those are two large numbers because they're not zero. But 98% of our positions are filled with energetic, optimistic teachers looking forward to our students' arrival on the 24th. Um, many businesses would crave to have a 98% rate. So I think the focus could be on that more so than on the vacancies. But given the vacancies, um, our team is uh, working incredibly hard to find teachers to fill those few remaining ones. It, it goes back to my earlier point. Our, our best opportunity to hire the best teacher for your child is in April and May of the year. Our best opportunity to recommit to that teacher that helped your child pass that end of grade test and move on to the next grade or receive their high school diploma is in April or May of each year when other districts are trying to pick them off. Um, what would help our system fulfill those vacancies is to have a budget and a plan in the spring of each year, much as Virginia has. The second thing that would really help is the same thing that successful businesses have. They put together, they recognize that talent is supreme and they have competitive compensation and benefits packages combined with a winning culture, a culture that says we want you, we value you, we appreciate you, we need you. Those would be the tools that would enable our principals to more effectively and quickly staff our schools. It's certainly encouraging to hear that perspective. Uh, on a broader level, Bill, I know you and I have talked about declining interest in the teaching profession and, and that culture I think is something we at the College of Education are, are striving to capture as well. Uh, what, what's the college doing to to remind people uh, how rewarding and appealing a career as a teacher can be? Well, I, I think that uh, you've asked a great question because that is a high priority for the College of Education. I mentioned earlier that having those relationships with our local school districts in our region is incredibly important. Building those bridges, building those relationships, and I think most importantly, having UNC Charlotte go out to the high schools in our region and talk to students who are considering teaching as a profession, encouraging them to take on the profession. Uh, as of being a former teacher, it was the best job I ever had. It was extremely rewarding, a very noble profession, but due to some of the external factors that we're facing today, there is a decline. And it's not just a decline in, Charlotte, in the Charlotte region, but it's a national decline. UNC Charlotte has done pretty well, but we can do better. I think another great thing that we have is our campus. And if we can get these young students as juniors and seniors to visit our campus, come to our College of Education, talk to some of our students, talk to some of our professors, see the student union, see the campus. Our campus has really changed in the last few years. I believe that's a great uh, place for us to be to encourage these young people to come here. But they need to see us. They need to hear us. Uh, they need to see the campus. And I'm convinced that we will see an increase in our enrollment. If I could add one other sure. thought. One thing that makes it so challenging to fill these positions, despite the great efforts of colleges like UNC Charlotte, is uh, our high turnover across the state. Um, today, as a state, we get about 5,000 of our teachers from our great schools of education like UNC Charlotte, but we need 15,000 a year. We could vastly reduce that 15,000 if we had a culture of caring and respect and professionalism uh, towards our existing teachers, kept them in our classrooms, and then we wouldn't have this pressure to hire so many year after year, and we'd get the benefit of the f previous investment. So I think that needs to be part of our strategy, too. And Bill, I know the College of Education is undertaking some efforts to address just that yes. uh, with the new teacher support program. Yes. Could you talk to me just a bit yes. about that? The new teacher support program is a program that has incredible data points. Um, the outcomes are phenomenal. Uh, the new teacher support program, UNC Charlotte is one of six UNC anchor institutions that has this program in place. We currently have 158 teachers that are a part of this program for UNC Charlotte. We have five coaches that really live out of their cars because they live in the classrooms of these teachers that they work with. But the best thing for me to tell you about is the retention rate. If you're in the new teacher support program, the retention rate is 95 percent. 
and we have these teachers in some of our most challenged schools in the district. Um, had a conversation with the superintendent just the other day about trying to expand this program. New teachers need support. They need mentors, they need coaches, they need people to help them. Um, a, a very wise principal friend of mine, my mentor actually, told me something years ago and he said the most important thing you ever do as a principal is number one, hire a teacher. The second most important thing you do is keep a teacher. Retention rates are nothing to brag about right now, so anything we can do to help retain these teachers is incredibly important. So the new teacher support program is a real feather in the cap for the UNC Charlotte College of Education. Now we touched on this a bit earlier, but I want to return to STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Superintendent Clark noted that in 2011, North Carolina universities only graduated one physics teacher. And that same year, at a national level, only one third of Americans, American uh, primary school students, were proficient in science and math. What's the importance of addressing some of the shortcomings in STEM education and in improving STEM education at CMS, Eric? So I must admit, I'm, I'm pretty biased. I'm a professional engineer in North Carolina and come from a line of engineers in my family. So, uh, you know, I'm immersed in it. Um, you know, engineering is at its core a problem-solving discipline. It might be building a bridge or a road or um, a building, launching a rocket into space, whatever. It's problem-solving. And our problems in American society and in Charlotte are becoming more complex and more challenging every day. We need more problem solvers. The, the other skill that engineering brings is the ability to take a complex issue and describe it in simple everyday terms so that the majority of us can understand it and participate in the solution. Those skills far beyond quadratic equations and uh, stress and strain are what we need as a society from a science, technology, engineering, and math curriculum. Yeah, we need to improve our infrastructure and we need to uh, invest as our governor wants to in North Carolina's future and infrastructure, but it's those skills of problem solving and communicating and um, moving us forward that's so critical. Um, as far as the teachers, uh, the one physics teacher, most of our world operates in a supply and demand situation, but not public education. And that's one of the things we could adopt from the market is we should recognize where we have greater demand. We should uh, create um, incentives, greater opportunities, benefits for going into those high demand fields. Um, what I've discussed with Bill and with Dean McIntyre here at UNC Charlotte is let's create a continuous loop. Our graduates are their incoming freshmen. Their graduates are our teachers. We are in this together and no more important than in STEM. And so this interdependency, continuous loop, fostering uh, partnership in STEM is, is a critical way to meet that need. Thoughts? Yeah, I had mentioned earlier that one of the responsibilities of the College of Education is to listen to our partners, and our partners are the regional school districts. When I go out and talk to superintendents and ask them about what are their greatest needs, what are your shortages, I hear the same thing from every superintendent. Middle school and high school, science and math, they're at the top of the list. UNC Charlotte is doing something very concrete to address this, which I mentioned earlier, and that's the early college that's on our campus. That is an example of pure collaboration between CMS and the University of North Carolina at Charlotte and the EPIC program to develop these teachers, to develop these engineers, and hopefully more science and math teachers. Uh, that has been wildly successful. Um, public education, traditional public education is changing. And I think CMS is on the front line of addressing some of these needs and finding what do parents really want and then making a school that works. 
a lot of the early college initiatives that CMS has taken on have been hugely successful. Mm -hmm. And these are the kind of things that I think as we move forward, we need to continue to work on, dream about, and then have them become reality. But that reality is less than a half a mile away from here, and it's hugely success successful in its second year with a CMS principal, with CMS students on the university campus. We're, we're so thankful for UNC Charlotte for being a partner with us in that early college school and for the county and for the voters of Mecklenburg County approving a bond that enabled us to create this opportunity. My, my only regret is it's so small. We have a wait list of probably more than 400 students wanting to get in this thing. You know, we, we need to grow these as fast as we can because our students need it. And since I have you here, Eric, I'm going to ask you about something that I know most of our local audience will be interested in, and that's CMS's process of reviewing the student assignment plan. Could you give me an overview of where the district's at now and what you foresee over the next year or two? Sure. So at our meeting Tuesday night, we had a number of um, citizens speak to us about the need to increase diversity in our schools, and we certainly must do that. The concentrations of poverty are incredibly damaging to our students and overwhelming to our teachers. But at the end of that public comment period, there was also a citizen who spoke about a desire to go to a school closer to his home. And so in one night, we saw two of the poles that we must operate within, uh, increased diversity and proximity. Earlier in uh, some of our discussions, one of my colleagues eloquently described the point of view of a parent who is dissatisfied with their home school assignment and some of which have found relief either through magnet schools or charter schools. Another colleague, equally eloquent, spoke of the parent who is satisfied with the home school, but don't you mess with it, because if you do, I'm out of here. I'll go to a charter. Again, those two polls. I think that the third piece is that at the end of the day, assuming the parent has the capacity and the opportunity, the parent will make the choice, the final choice about where a child goes. So what I think this effort will take is one to recognize that there is no single policy that can span those entire spectrums. Um, that it will take a lot of creativity and compassion and grace to come up with something that the majority of our citizens can support. And, um, and it must start with the fundamental um, that at the end of the day the parent will make the choice. So exactly how we will get there, um, I don't want to predict how my colleagues and I, in fact I'm going to a meeting right after this to work on that. Um, but one thing we must do is we must deal with concentrations of poverty. We must honor the desire of members of our community to attend the school near their child. And we must respect that it's the parent's choice at the end of the day. You know, I don't know how we would decide which students to move out of a school and where they would go and which students to move back into that school and where they would come from in order to address diversity. It would be much more powerful if we had data, maybe UNC Charlotte can help us with this, that helps us in a very specific way understand the way parents will make their choices and then craft a policy that responds to that input. I learned early in my business career, know your customer. I think that would be an important step for us to take at this point. Now, Bill, uh, Eric mentioned the racial and economic disparities that CMS has a history of, of trying to combat and UNC Charlotte held an event earlier this year that sought to brought the, bring the community together and talk about some of those issues. These are ultimately decisions the school board must make but what do you think the importance is of community conversations about these issues? I think it's incredibly important and the first event that UNC sponsored was about uh, along the lines of the book The Dream Long Deferred which was Fry Gelliard's um, history lesson on where Charlotte was in the 60s, uh, basically up to 2000 when the pupil assignment plan was basically dismantled at that point. 
Um, I want to go back to something before I start answering that question, though, that Eric said. Um, Eric talked about parents and parents making decisions about what's in the best interest of my child. Being a, a principal for 13 years, I learned something very quickly that parents are not objective when it comes to their own child. Parents always want what's best for their own child. So I think that's one of the challenges that the board faces. But when I think about where we are today, and I think back on my career, I was very fortunate to be principal of Myers Park High School, the largest high school in the state. And I was so lucky that I had a really good culture in our building. And one of the reasons that culture was so strong is because I had teachers with 20 to 30 years of experience, teachers with 10 to 20, and then I had teachers with zero to five and five to 10. So I had a real nice mixture of teachers at different places in their career that contributed to a very positive, collegial um, culture. One of the challenges that I think CMS faces right now and in our, many of our high poverty schools is that we have a very young staff in many of these schools, teachers with less than 10 years of experience or less than five years of experience. And I think that's tough. So I think CMS struggles, as do other urban districts struggle in developing that culture when you have so many young teachers that don't have the wisdom and haven't been around for a long time. So I think that's one of the challenges that the district faces right now. We know that isolation and high percentages of students who live in poverty make it a more difficult school. Student achievement is often lower, almost always lower. Um, so I think some of the challenges that we face as a community, UNC Charlotte's trying to address this. And we had our first event. Uh, I believe you were at the event. There were uh, like 400 people that were there. The energy was very high. People want to talk about this. And UNC Charlotte's going to be sponsoring a second event. And that's the date's not finalized, but a second event. It's going to be called the Grand Grandchildren of Brown. And it's about Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, when all the desegregation orders came from the federal government, et cetera. So we have to talk about this. The community wants input. And I think it's so encouraging to hear Eric say that that's something that the board really wants to do, is they want to hear from parents. They want to hear from the community. So we hope that we can do that with this second event and more events going forward. Yeah, and as we approach the close of our show, any final comments? Yeah, if I can add one thing, we, we need to hear not just verbally, but through that survey right. data. But uh, the other thing I wanted to add is Bill's efforts prior to being at UNC Charlotte around community conversations are incredibly important, particularly around student assignment. The, the challenges and needs that our students have come to us and based on the condition of their neighborhoods and the city that we live in. We need a collaborative conversation with the city of Charlotte and the towns and a collaborative conversation with the county about the intersection of housing policy and education policy, health and human services and education. We need to work as a team. And a way to do that possibly is to forge a community conversation with, together with our partners. Thank you guys so much for being here. And that's about all the time we have for this week's edition of the Live Wire for CMS School Board Member Eric Davis and College of Education Community Relations Director Bill Anderson. I'm Will City. Tune in next week, same time same place.